It's good to see everybody. God is good all the time. And we say that as a call and response, but you know what? God is good. Wow. Just um, you think about it. even if you've had a week that uh, is not from heaven, there's another place stuff can come from. You know? Even if you get one of those weeks, it doesn't change that. You know, God is so good. And uh, we're celebrating that here today in our praise and worship music, but also in the, the ceremony that we're about to participate in. Uh, but I wanted to invite uh, our minister of the gospel, Bob Collins, to come up. Uh, he's going to do a precursor, just an introduction, and I'll, I'll uh, take over from there. Only about an hour. Only about an hour, Bob said. Isn't it? And that's short for him, really. Yeah. <laughs> it's because a sentence for him is seven minutes long. <laughs> Well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Jerry asked me a couple weeks ago if I, I wouldn't say uh, something uh, at this ordination ceremony. So uh, he didn't put a time restriction on me, but uh, I will be brief, <laughs> but to the point. It's a very humbling day in a life of a person when they're asked to pastor in a church. Myself, uh, when uh, Jerry asked me, uh, of course I do prison ministry, and I'm a pastor called to do that ministry. And normally, uh, in a non-denominational church, there is a calling on a person's life that brings about the change for him to be used where God would plant him. I, I like to read this scripture, and it's, there aren't a lot of scriptures about pastor. But I'm going to read this one because I think this best signifies the position of a pastor. Uh, it's Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Yes. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is what that is good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know, uh, depending on, and there are many different backgrounds uh, here this morning. And uh, some of you may have came out of the Catholic Church. Uh, and uh, in that church, it was very, very organized. And people were raised on high within the church. Uh, the, the, the pastor of the church is called Father, and he's, and, he, and he's placed on this lofty place in the church. When we come into some of the, the Lutheran church, there's a division within the churches and how they do it. And there's procedures for everything. Down to, you know, this would be a formality the way we do this today. Uh, if you went to a Methodist church, you know, it, it would be different. If you went to this church and that church and the other church, it would be different. But normally they, they're raising this person. Uh, to a higher level. And I think the scriptures really tell us, and, and, and I think God only gives one command here, and that is feed my sheep. Amen. Do you agree? Yes. Yes. Feed my sheep. You know? And that's an awesome task. And that's a very humbling task. It's not a task where you're raised on high. Some people would think that if they become a pastor, they've, they, they've moved up, moved up. But no, it's actually not moving you really down, but you're the servant of all. Yeah. It's a place of service. And I am so proud to know Mr. Steele, and I, I believe I know his heart, and I believe that he is a servant and wants to be a servant of all. It's a calling. I, I do believe that. In those churches where there are a lot of uh, hierarchy, uh, they don't leave a lot of room for God in a lot of things. 
And here in a non-denominational church, we have to believe a lot of things to God. And, and, and I know in my own ordination, uh, Jerry, Jerry was called to ordain me. You know, it wasn't a thing of his own. What it did for me, though, it allowed me to do my ministry in prisons and in jails, where if I were something other than a pastor, I couldn't even get in. The same way with Joyce, uh, as she's ministering in jails and prisons. So I, I just, I don't want to take anything away from you, Josh, but don't get a big swell head. Okay? <laughs> Uh, I, and I say that because my head swells sometimes, and my wife uh, brings me down where I want. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to echo the words of my wife. Good job, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> or good job, Lisa. Good job, Wendy. You know, you know how that goes. Uh, it is a calling, isn't it? I, uh, years ago, got the calling and I hung up. Because <laughs> I did not want this, you know. Not, this wasn't, I didn't grow up thinking, ooh, I'm going to be a pastor. Uh, if anything, I grew up thinking, my, my grandfather was a pastor. And I grew up thinking there is no way a sane human being would choose to do this. There's just no way. So I guess that... Tells you a little bit about our sanity, I guess, uh, I suppose. But, but I want to thank Bob for, for opening, giving us an understanding of somewhat of, of what we're dealing with. Because uh, I have pictures down here I don't want to be distracted by. It's a donkey calling, and I'm winning. It's uh, level six. Here's a question of Sandy sometimes, Regina. I realize it. But I realize also who you're married to is who you're used to dealing with it. Uh, now, the biblical definition of ordination, well, he knows. It's not like it's a strange thought to him. But, uh, the biblical definition of an ordination refers to a setting in place, which is such a, such a great concept. Or uh, even in one word, a designation. And I just love that. Uh, and we can understand that by understanding in Scripture, for instance, Joseph was ordained as the ruler of Egypt. You can read about that in Acts 7.10. Uh, the steward in the parable that Jesus told, Matthew 24.45, was ordained to oversee a household. So he was designated. He was set in place. It's just really good to understand this. Deacons were ordained to serve the Jerusalem church in Acts 6, 1 through 6. And pastors were ordained uh, in each city in Crete. Uh, you can read about that in Titus chapter 1, verse 5. In none of these cases, though, as Bob was alluding to, in none of these cases, though, uh, is the mode of ordination specified. And there really are no specific ceremonial uh, methods exemplified to follow in Scripture. The ordinations are simply appointments of designation or the setting of someone in place. Knowing that helps us understand what we're doing here this morning. And, and really, I hope it helps us understand how vital this is to the body of Christ and how important this is. And I'll get into that in just a second. Acts 13, 2-3 includes uh, a very good example of ministerial appointment. While they were worshiping, the Lord, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So, and as a matter of, of understanding what we're doing, uh, this is only so you know uh, where we are, I, I fasted this morning because I knew we were going to pray. And that, as far as ceremony, that's about as... Heavy duty as he gets. There's really not much more to it. But I have fasted because we're going to pray. Because I wanted to really step and emulate the scriptures. Acts chapter 13. So you're not supposed to fast and tell people, but I'm telling you because so you understand the ceremony, okay? I don't have, you know, sackcloth and ashes. Although that is very comfortable. Uh, <laughs> How would I know that? Anyway, in, in this passage then, 
we can, uh, and, and I think we should notice some key features here, some key facts which line up with the scriptures. Number one, it is God himself who calls people to ministry. Not grandma, not grandpa, not pastor, not anybody else. It's God himself who calls people to ministry and qualifies them with the gifts necessary to be who they are. This coincides with scripture, Acts 20, 28, Ephesians 4, 11. All these are in your bulletin as well as your handout. Number two, the members of the fellowship of the church recognize God's clear leading and embrace it. Now, I've been in fellowships where that's not the case. And I laugh to keep from crying. But, but in this fellowship, it is the case. Number three, with prayer and fasting, the church lays hands on Paul and, and Barnabas to demonstrate their commissioning. This is also evident in other parts of Scripture. Acts uh, chapter 6, verse 6, 1 Timothy 5, 22. Number four, God works, and we've talked about this for years, God works through His church. As both the members and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, are reported to send the qualified. We send whom God qualifies. Paul, Apostle Paul, repeatedly ordained pastors for the churches that he planted. He did that one right after another. He and Barnabas directed the appointment or ordination of elders in every church, in each church in Galatia. Uh, Acts 14, verse 23. He instructed Titus to appoint elders in every town in Crete, as in Titus 1.5. Titus himself had been ordained when he was chosen by the churches, and you can read about, about that again in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, in the aforementioned passages, then, everything I've laid out, the ordination of elders involves the whole congregation, not just the apostles. Everybody's involved in it. The Greek word used in 2 Corinthians 8.19 for Titus' appointment and also in Acts 14.23 for the choosing of the Galatian elders literally means to stretch forth the hands. Yes. Isn't that awesome? That's what it means. And I think it means to stretch forth the hands to push somebody. <laughs> Go do it. <laughs> you know, because if you've met people who are called by God, most of us don't respond all of it. Now, some do, but most of us don't respond by, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want everybody to know my business. I want to live in a glass house, and I want to be criticized for everything that I say and do and wear and how I comb my hair and, and whether or not I have a beard. I want to do all that. You know, usually you have to push them. Go. Do what God has called you to do. And that's what, that's what ordain means. It's, it's, it's so cool to know that the apostles and the congregations knew whom the Spirit had chosen. They knew it. GYB, our elders here, which is GYB, stands for God, your back. We know that, that God has chosen. We know that. And so we choose to respond to that. They responded by placing those people in servant leadership. When God calls and God qualifies a person for specific ministry, it will be apparent both to that person and to the majority of the fellowship. Notice how I didn't say all the fellowship. Because there's always going to be somebody who just hates green. <laughs> That's the way it is. We're, we're all different, you know. So, so to the majority of everybody recognize, when God calls and qualifies a person for ministry, it's pretty obvious. It's not like it's a, a big mystery, or it shouldn't be anyway. It's the duty of the elders then, together with the congregation, uh, as part of the body of Christ, to recognize and accept the calling that God has placed on somebody's life. This is the reason we have... For us, it's formal. It may not be formal to some of you, but for us, it's a formal commissioning ceremony, an ordination service. That's why we do this. This is so very, very appropriate. It's not mandatory, but it is appropriate because the ordination ceremony itself does not confer any special power. There's not going to be a lightning bolt come down and zap Josh with power, and all of a sudden, oh, he's the pastor. You know, that, that's not what this uh, sound effects do. Can you imagine? 
That's not what happens. This, this ceremony does not confer any power. Neither does the laying on of hands. It simply gives public recognition of God's choice of leadership. That's what we're doing here this morning. Here at Hope Life, and, and Bob even talked about this, we've ordained, we have set in place, we have designated, we have ordained four different people, including myself, and today we just add another. I was ordained uh, for a two-year uh, test period, <laughs> just to see if it was going to take, I guess, and then after the end of the two years, then it was permanent. Uh, uh, but, but I want to be sure that we understand uh, this idea of multiplicity, plurality. Why plural? Why do we have different people ordained? Why several instead of just one, which seems to be a, a, a trend? Well, I perceive that multiple servant leadership helps avoid a personality cult syndrome. That's something I've just come up with. Personality <laughs> cult syndrome. I don't know if they, we'll get that in the DSM sometime, I guess. But it's where everything's focused on one person. That's what we do as American Christians. We focus on, well, who's your pastor? Here's the pastor. That's a, that's a cult. That's a personality cult syndrome. The focus that one single pastor typically gets in our American Christian culture should be spread among others. It's, a, it's meant to be scripturally. It's meant to be plural. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's we're a body. We're not a, a pastor. Everybody else just blindly like the you know the strings and you just follow them all. It's meant to be plural. We're meant to have leaders, uh, plurality. Uh, and, and so understanding that, uh, for instance, for knowing that, for instance, say the the founding senior pastor goes to be with the Lord. Now this particular one's got another fifty years, but let's just say. <laughs> But let's just say, okay, the founding senior pastor goes to be with the Lord. What happens? Most of the time, everything just falls apart most of the time. Because everything has been focused on one person. And, and, and they go to be with the Lord, and the fellowship is not left with uh, anything. And then one of the most difficult times a church can go through, a body of Christ can go through, is this experience of not having a leader and of looking for one. That That's... Trauma. That's crisis. That, and we know this just from dealing with it. Uh, Bob and I have talked, even other churches most recently, the trauma of this. Even if the church has an interim pastor, it's still very, very difficult. Transitions are much smoother when there's multiple servant leaders already in place. And that's a good, there's all kinds of reasons for it, but that's one good reason. Plus, there's always a backup pastor, a backup teacher, a backup preacher when the need arises. And I'm telling you, the need arises all the time because pastors are not omnipresent. Yeah. Even though that's in the job description. <laughs> They're not omnipresent. It's impossible. Only God is omnipresent. So that's why plurality. That's why there has to be more than one. Joyce Johnson has been ordained by Hope Light. She was publicly recognized and accepted as being called by God to be an evangelist. Joyce, just stand up so everybody see who you are. And it's okay to recognize her. Thank you. Ordained as an evangelist. And you know we got some flack. We ordained a woman. What is wrong with you people? Yeah. Well, God's the one who called, not me. Yes. It's in God's choice. So she's an arm of our outreach. God has delegated her to the function of of evangelism. And we still today recognize that she is set apart by God for the work of ministry in taking the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. But specifically, if Joyce is not here, you can pretty well count on it. She's preaching the gospel and sharing the gospel in prison. Amen. Uh, and that's by God's choosing. Joyce is an evangelist. We recognize that. We <laughs> pushed her out there. <laughs> Go! We, said, we have also set in place, as Bob referred to, Bob Collins. Bob was publicly accepted and being uh, recognized as being called by God to be a minister of the gospel. We called it that, even though it's a pastorship, we called it that because that, that really fits who Bob is, a minister of the gospel. He's an arm of our outreach. Uh, God has 
delegated several functions to Bob Collins. Evangelism, fellowship, discipleship, servant leadership. I mean, multiplicity right there. But he's got the wisdom and the ears to be able to, to function. Although if you talk to him, he'll tell you, no, I don't. Yeah. But, but he does. Yeah. And we recognize that. And while Bob is actively and progressively involved with aftercare prison ministries, he goes in and comes out uh, with Brothers Keeper. He's also involved in servant leadership here at Hope Life. He is by no means limited to those realms of influence. By no means. By God's choosing, Bob Collins is a minister of the gospel wherever he goes and whatever he does. We recognize that. And Bob, everybody saw you, so you don't have to stand up now. <laughs> Brian Moore has been ordained. Uh, by Hope Life. He was publicly accepted as being called by God to be a pastor. As an integral part of this body, God has delegated to him the function of fellowship pastor. His call to maintain hope through relationships places him and his wife Wendy in servant leadership to us through our fellowship team. And believe me, it's no easy thing to do. Uh, uh, have you ever tried to have a relationship with people like you? <laughs> Thanks. That's a good way to put that, Dan. I just, you know. <laughs> Should we put that in the transcript? I don't think so. Pastor Brian is called to the function of caring for the flock. And, and if you ever talk to for 30 seconds, you'll know, yeah. That, yeah, that's exactly what he's called to do. His application of gifts is directed towards the people attending worship and also the, the congregation, the people that just come in and visit. He plans, promotes, supervises, and is involved in fellowship support type groups, pastoral care, uh, hospital visits, relationship building, and maintaining. Uh, and then he also coordinates and teaches different classes. His gifts really do uh, encourage us and keep us on track by maintaining hope through relationship and relationship building. By God's choosing, Brian is our fellowship pastor. So, so I think you can see how all this works together. By God's choosing. Now today, we will ordain, we will set aside, we will recognize and accept God's calling on Joshua Steele. As Bob said, Mr. Steele. That sounds so ooh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Mr. Steele. <laughs> and I'm just me, right? We know that. When I was ordained, he's just him letting go. <laughs> or getting out of here, one or the other. All right? So the morning we, we're going to, this morning, we're going to set in place, we're going to delegate Joshua as our teaching pastor. And that should come as no surprise. If it does, let's talk. But most of you are like, yeah, okay, sure. And as you may have guessed, God's anointing on Joshua comes with this responsibility to teach us primarily, not exclusively, but primarily from the pulpit. His teaching will periodically include Bible classes to all ages and, and actually all levels of the church members, along with sermons. But a major part of his responsibilities will be to fill in for me when I'm not here, when I'm physically not here. <laughs> so that's understood. I thank you for the clarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We needed that clarity, Joshua. So Joshua is passionate. If you haven't talked to him, you need to talk to him just for a few minutes because he is passionate about God's word. Passionate, especially about teaching God's word. And he has he has he already has leadership qualifications and which include managing personnel. But he has prior and proven teaching experience along with excellent communication skills. Uh, he really does. He, God is gifted in this way. He not only agrees with Hope Light's vision and statement of faith, he's more than willing to be held accountable and work well with our elders. Just that alone, uh, you should get a gift certificate for it. <laughs> of some kind. Yeah. I, I firmly believe that Joshua is going to provide us. He already has in GYB, but I think he's going to provide us even more so with spiritual guidance and the modeling of an exemplary lifestyle. And I praise God publicly before all of you on, on the Internet, uh, if this goes on TV, because the channel's not working right now, but I praise God publicly and thank Him publicly for providing Hope Light Community Church with who and what we need when we need them. 
Oh, amen. 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 By God's choosing then, so it's understood, by God's choosing, Joshua is our teaching pastor. So Joshua, this morning we acknowledge, acknowledge and affirm what God has done and is going to do, what He's currently doing and He's going to do through you. So I'm asking you to just please step up here if you would, and turn around and, and face the congregation. Elders, if you'd come up, uh, we want to uh, take time now. Joshua has his uh, certificate in, in licensing. Uh, I can't get that open. I don't want it. We're going to anoint Joshua according to Scripture and pray over him. But let me make the, the proclamation here as we get ready. Let it be known on this 27th day of July 2014 that Joshua Steele is hereby ordained under the ministry of Hope Life Community Church to perform all duties and functions necessary as a teaching pastor among this people of God in Jesus Christ. This ordination creates nothing but recognizes God's calling and the Holy Spirit's anointing on Joshua and is intended to facilitate his own personal growth as well as the proving of the ministry the Lord has placed on him. In the name of Jesus Christ, let it be so. Brian, lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you that... Uh, we are following in your lead. You have already taken care of anointing, teaching, guiding, and blessing Josh. Lord, we just thank you for sharing him with our fellowship here. We thank you for his passion, his love, and just, Father, how he can just turn it all around, that you give him, that he is willing to pass it out to everyone around him. Lord, we just thank you for all the many things that you have in store for him, the many blessings of his family, the many blessings of this family here. Lord, take him now. We are now pushing him forward into your hands even further because he's going to need to be as close to you as he possibly can, Father. Lord, love on him, bless him, and we all come together and say amen, amen. for your amen. name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. Josh, just stay, just right, stay right there. Uh, guys, you can come back and get ready. Uh, Mike, could you? Uh... I'm going to ask you now. We're going to close out in some more worship. But as we do, just like we file in for communion, I'm going to ask you to come around and uh, shake Josh's hand, give him a word of encouragement, a big hug. Casey was standing here next to him. I appreciate it. And give him a word of encouragement. Let him know that, that we do support God's calling in his life as we worship with these last two songs.